Kia ora everyone, welcome to this Good Filler Unit webinar on atopic dermatitis and the ageing skin, the role of ceramides. With us tonight is um, Dr. Lisa Connolly, who's a specialist dermatologist with over 15 years of experience. She specialises in treating all conditions related to the skin, hair and nails, and she has additional expertise in paediatric dermatology conditions and currently she is one of only a handful of paediatric dermatologists in New Zealand so we're very lucky to have her tonight and she is the only one in New Plymouth. Thank you Helen and thank you to the Goodfellow unit for uh, inviting me uh, to give this presentation. As Helen mentioned I am a uh, US trained dermatologist and also a specialized uh, certified dermatologist in New Zealand as of about six years ago. And I'm the founder and director of Integrative Dermatology or iDerm clinic in New Plymouth. So if you're ever down these ways, please stop by and say hi. And I will disclose that I am receiving an honorarium for this lecture today um, from CeraVe and La roche -Posay. Sorry if I can interrupt as well. I would like to thank our, our sponsor is L'Oreal as well. Thank you. So our key learning objectives for today is to understand the role of the barrier function in atopic dermatitis. We'll briefly review the current management and treatment and look at the microbiome and how that has an impact on the pathogenesis of atopic eczema. And lastly, these quote unquote super moisturizers. So what makes them different? What makes them better? And in, at the end, as Helen mentioned, we'll take your questions. So atopic dermatitis or atopic eczema usually develops in infancy. It will improve for most patients over their lifetime. However, it can persist into adulthood, as you know. And al although rare, adult onset can also occur. I think of atopic eczema as a spectrum of disease rather than one disease. I often will say that there, it's a phenotype that we recognize. Uh, but the root cause can vary depending on the genetics of your individual patient. So we know that genetics plays a role in skin barrier dysfunction, and we know that the genetics plays a role, genetic abnormalities will play a role in the immune response. So if you think of syndromes such as hyper IgE, Wiscott Aldrich, those are all immune mediated reasons for an atopic eczema type picture. But if you think of ichthyosis or if you think of a filaggrin mutation, that will lead to classic eczema and be as a result of a skin barrier defect. But most of our patients are gonna fall somewhere in the middle of that. And then you have to add the environmental impact of irritants, of allergens, food allergies, environmental allergies, and then the microbiome. And so it becomes quite complicated, not only in pathogenesis, but then in the management. And the hallmark of eczema is going to be itch, not just an acute itch, but a chronic itch. And the location of eczema is going to vary depending on the age of your patient. So in infants and newborns, you will see it over convex surfaces, the cheeks, the, um, the, the elbows, the knees, the buttocks. And as um, the child grows, that moves and becomes more internal. So you have antecubital fossa, popliteal fossas, and a, and a movement from the cheeks up towards the eyelids in someone who's who's very prone to irritation. And that distribution will continue on to adulthood with the difference that as the disease becomes more chronic, you might see more chronic changes uh, or what we call lichenification, as I'll show you in a few slides. Now the hallmark of eczema is itch and there is an itch scratch cycle that we like to explain to patients. Um, so you start with itch, you scratch that itch and you start traumatizing the skin, you traumatize those keratinocytes. They are going to release inflammatory cytokines and markers and they're going to lead to an immune response. And before you know it, you now have this cycle where the itch causes more damage and then that damage causes more of that itch sensation. Um, you can have neuropeptide mediators involved in there that are gonna um, propagate the itch, as well as pro-inflammatory cytokines, prostaglandins, neuropeptides, all of these are going to play a role to continue that itch scratch cycle. And so this is an example of chronic eczema, both in a patient that is fair and one that is more pigmented. And what they have in common is accentuation of the skin lines or the skin folds, and that's what we call lichenification. You also see in the top photo that we have some excoriations. So not only is this a chronic patch of eczema, but there is an overlying acute process going on as well, whereas the one underneath it seems to be a more burnt out but chronic eczema with that hyper, hypertrophy and hypertrophic papules. 
Now, when we look at atopic eczema for years, and I remember when I was in training that we would sit and debate whether eczema was an outside-in phenomenon, meaning there's a problem with the skin barrier and that's why you develop eczema, versus eczema is an inside-out phenomenon where it's primarily immune mediated. And that's why then you end up with a skin barrier dysfunction. And it turns out that the genetics has shown us that both are true. And as I mentioned previously, you're going to have people that are going to be on the extremes of this spectrum, but the majority are going to fall somewhere in the middle. So you have an abnormal skin barrier, you have abnormal proteins, abnormal lipids, Add to that colonization with Staph aureus, which can trigger an immune response, similar if you're allergic to Staph, the way that um, food allergy or an environmental allergy can trigger an immune response. And then once you have that immune response, you've got this overexpression of these type two cytokines that are gonna be very pro-inflammatory, that are gonna activate those keratinocytes to propagate that, that inflammation. Um, and before you know it, you have the classic eczema patch or plaque. Now we have we can't ignore the environmental factors, and I think those are really important. And this is where personalizing the care to your patient um, is going to go a very long way. And and um, when we read articles about atopic eczema and the management of atopic eczema, I think you have to read them with a grain of salt and look as to where is this research coming from, what country, what time of the year, because you'd be surprised how much of a factor that can be. So for example, I've, I've practiced all over the United States with varying um, temperatures and the original articles for eczema were out of Oregon, which has a climate that's very similar to New Plymouth. And yet there I was practicing in Miami, which for all intents and purposes, I could have been on the Gold Coast of Australia. And I can just tell you that patients that are in hot, humid environments have to be managed a little bit differently than patients that are in very cold, wet or dry environments. And so remember that as, as you're approaching your patients that these subtleties in their environment are gonna make a big difference. You know, if, if, it's, um, if it's the middle of summer, do they have anything to keep them cool? Or are they in a really hot house without any airflow? Um, and if that's the case, then what are they wearing to bed? Are they keeping them cool? Is there a fan to try to, um, try to uh, evaporate some of that sweat, or are they sitting covered? Because if they're covered up, then they don't scratch. So these little intricacies are gonna make a big difference for your individual patients. Um, in addition to that, we have to think about whether they're using bubble baths or real soap, or they're changing, you know, that they're excessively drying their skin or in the era of COVID, how much hand sanitizer are they using? Because definitely that will irritate and then progress on to eczema. And then when we look at allergens, I think these are in a class by themselves. So if you have contact allergy, that is a different diagnosis. And so patients can have atopic eczema and they can develop a contact allergy in addition to that. And in essence, have two different conditions at the same time. And aller contact allergens can come by way of preservatives, by way of fragrances in, in products. Um, think of your perfumes, your bubble baths, your highly naturally scented shampoos, for example, um, or metals, um, earrings, piercings, um, nickel in, in costume jewelry, or even in, um, in, in, in play scissors or like a Montessori type environment where they're, where they're very active with, with different tools. Um, and then we have to add to that the complications of, of real food and environmental allergies. Um, I personally have seen uh, dairy allergy induce a very severe atopic eczema. And once you can remove that culprit from the environment, it doesn't mean that they're cured, but their eczema becomes more manageable. So there are these, these specific cases where allergens are going to be a very big role in the pathogenesis. And lastly, and I think something that's been getting more attention over the last few years is the microbiome and what impact Staph aureus is having on the skin in terms of colonizing the skin and acting as a super antigen and triggering allergy as well. And the last thing would be infection and viral particles. If you've ever seen a patient with eczema herpeticum, you know what I mean. And that is where they develop herpes lesions in every eczema patch or plaque. Uh, often these patients are quite sick uh, and, can be, and will need to be hospitalized for either IV or high dose um, antiviral treatment. So let's focus on, on, on the epidermis, which is the top layer of the skin. And this is depicted here in, um, in this rectangular patch. Below that is the dermis. 
stress. And that's where you're going to have all of your organelles, your blood vessels, your nerves, um, your sweat glands, your eccrine glands, your hair follicles, and then the subcutaneous fat. And if we look more closely at the epidermis, what we see is that the strand of corneum is at the very top, and that is sort of our interface with the world. Um, beyond that, we have four to five different layers of epidermis, depending on which part of the body we're focusing on. But for today's lecture, we're really going to look at the stratum corneum, and then we're going to look a little bit at that um, str uh, stratum granulosum and stratum spinosum and show you how that can interplay in terms of improving skin barrier function with the appropriate products. So the easiest way to think of the stratum corneum is as a brick wall, a brick and mortar system. And so by the time those keratinocytes have differentiated, they become corneocytes. They've lost their nucleus, they've lost their organelles, and there are these flat little sandwiches. And within that is where we have um, the mortar or the, the lipid bilayer. And within this, we have filaggrin, which turns out to be a very, very important protein in the differentiation and progression and development of that stratum corneum. It's actually a, um, a, a keratinocyte aggregating protein. And when it's mutated, you're going to have disruption of that mortar, disruption of um, water retention, and disruption in natural moisturizing factor. What's interesting is that you can have different mutations uh, that will lead to flagrant abnormalities. And so oftentimes patients who have atopic parents may inherit different genetic um, mutations from each parent, then propagating or worsening their eczema as a result. So when the epidermal barrier is distorted, when you have increase in transepidermal water loss, you can develop symptomatic skin just, just by drying out the skin. And as I mentioned earlier, you can dry the skin out artificially by using hand sanitizers, by using soap that is too harsh, by a, a sharp change in the weather, increasing in the wind, for example. Patients will complain that their lips become really, really chapped. Um, and this can trigger that early itch that then can lead to worsening eczema. And so in addition to the filaggrin, the lipids that make up that mortar, that make up that um, lipid bilayer turn out to be extremely, extremely important. And the concentration of those lipids, that two to one to one ratio of ceramides, which are the ones that are mostly found, cholesterol, and then free fatty acids and other acids are integral in, in creating this very, very um, specific and effective lipid bilayer to keep those allergens out to retain the water in the stratum corneum and in the skin. So ceramides are really sphingolipids. And as I mentioned, they're going to help create that corneocyte lipid envelope. So they kind of envelop those corneocytes. Um, they're important in barrier function and they can change seasonally, as I alluded to, and in certain conditions. So that we know that as we age, we know that patients with atopic eczema, with psoriasis and with acne are going to have distorted amounts or levels of these ceramides. And again, this is just a review to say that in psoriasis, in acne, in aging skin, in atopic eczema, you will have abnormalities in the amount of ceramides um, found in the stratum corneum. And when we look at eczema specifically, you can see that when you look at healthy controls, there's a certain amount of ceramides one through six that you would expect to see. But in patients with atopic eczema, we find that in lesional and non-lesional skin, their ceramide levels will be decreased, a little bit more so in lesional skin. But even in what to the clinical eye looks like a normal skin, in an atopic, we'll have abnormal levels of ceramide. Now, how do we manage eczema? How do we treat it? And, and this could be a lecture all on its own. Um, and I'm going to give you a brief overview just to make sure that we're all on the same page. But if we look at um, this sort of treatment ladder or algorithm, we'll start at the very bottom. And those are your patients that are going to come in that have that seasonal dry skin. And your first line really is to hydrate, to moisturize. Um, and if we're lucky, that, that is enough. Um, but then it can escalate. Uh, and the patients will come in and say, well, I'm actually quite itchy. This, this, I've got this red patch. It doesn't go away. And that's where the introduction of a topical steroid, low to mid potency would be appropriate. Um, and, and now we have the advantage of also having access to the topical calcineurin inhibitors, such as um, pemacrolimus, which we've had for a while, but now um, can be um, subsidized through special authority and tacrolimus. Uh, 
uh, that goes by the brand name uh, Zeta. So these products can help to alleviate the inflammation and the symptoms of atopic eczema. Moving along that severity scale though, if, if the eczema becomes more moderate or severe, then we would move on to our, our mid to higher potency. Now I have to say that after almost it's almost now 20 years of practicing, I rarely, rarely have to use a high potency steroid in a child. In fact, I could even go as far as to say, I never use a high potency steroid in a child. In fact, if I find myself having to escalate the treatment, that's when I take a step back and say, well, am I just dealing with eczema or is there something else? Is there a contact allergy? Is there something else that I'm missing? Because I'm gonna go on a limb here to say, most run of the mill atopic eczema should respond to a mid potency steroid. Assuming that you are taking care of the skin barrier, that they're moisturizing, that you're taking care of the staff and that you're treating, treating them as holistically as you can and not ignoring those other factors where maybe their cleanser or maybe their habits or maybe their environment is somewhat sabotaging what you're trying to accomplish. So resist the urge of escalating the potency and it's okay to take a step back and say, well, let's, let's look at every, every, diff, every piece of the puzzle and, and are we meeting those needs effectively? And then there are patients that will progress regardless. Um, and those are the ones that become very recalcitrant um, and, and the disease is so widespread that a um, topical formulation is no longer appropriate. And, and, and then we would consider treatments such as narrowband UVB although that is limited by location, whether your DHB offers that and whether the patient is within uh, a range to actually benefit from two to three times a week of visiting the hospital in order to receive the light therapy. And so more often than not, we are treating them with methotrexate as our um, sort of first, second line drug. And beyond that, then we have um, uh, cyclosporin and or is a thiopin. But watch this space because I think that, you know, this is changing. Um, and in, you know, we, we have very selective access to dupilumab, which is a biologic, that's an IL-4, IL-13 inhibitor, which overseas is working quite well in treating refractory atopic eczema, not quite widely available in New Zealand. Uh, and it runs in the $10,000 a month price range. So it's something that's going to be very heavily regulated. Um, and then along those lines, um, we do have uh, hope for access to a ginus uh, kinase inhibitor, which is in pill form. Um, and that's a daily drug that is working very, very well for eczema overseas. And there is some talk of it being introduced in New Zealand, hopefully in, in the coming years. So why do we use topical steroids? As I explained to patients, because it is what works. There's lots of steroid phobia, but at the end of the day, nothing treats atopic eczema like an appropriate topical steroid. And under your management, they will not overuse it. They will not develop a dependency. And it should, it should work. Um, there, there's lots of steroid phobia. And so I find that you have to overcome that um, if, if you really want to get through um, and, and get the, the, the most benefit from it. So topical steroids are anti-inflammatory. They are locally immune suppressive. If you're using a drug that is too potent in the wrong patient, you will develop systemic immune suppression, but that should not be the goal. Um, and as I said, you should always opt for mild to moderate when, when approaching your eczema patients. Um, they are anti-proliferative and they're vasoconstrictive. In terms of vehicles, the topical steroids do come as lotions, as creams, and as ointments. Lotions are really only used on the scalp. I am going to go on a limb here again and say that there's really no role for lotions on the body. Unless you're dealing with a teenager who is extremely hairy that can't handle a cream, I really would not recommend using a lotion. And that's because they, they don't have enough of an emoluent in, to provide that degree of, of moisturization that, that you need. And they tend to be a bit drying and sometimes they will sting and, and, and burn the patient's skin. So as I talked about, you know, our first line of defense is to use a moisturizer. And so we're gonna, have, we're gonna look at moisturizers and just review with you what they contain and what they're all about. And so the idea of the moisturizer is that you're applying water to the skin and you're applying an occlusive ingredient that's gonna help trap that water in the skin. 
Now, anyone who's tried to make salad dressing knows that oil and water do not mix. So if you want to keep that in, in a suspension, you have to add an emulsifier and you have to add preservatives so that it doesn't go rancid. So now what you have, um, and you know, the commercially available or subsidized um, moisturizers, um, such as sorbaline, non-ionic cream, Ceta Macrobol, what you have is a combination of oil and water, emulsifier, preservatives, and in the case of sorbaline, a bit of glycerin. Now, of all the subsidized products, I think sorbaline would be my first choice. And the reason is so simple. One, it comes in a pump. And so then the patients don't have to open up those jars. They don't have to put their hands into the creams and, and potentially contaminate the, the, um, the, the containers that often come in, in extremely large sizes. And I can, I can tell you that we've done research to show that when you culture these big jars, you will grow not only staph, but strep and gram negative bacteria. So they are not sterile by any means. And so anything that you can do to limit that contact is going to be quite quite beneficial for your patients. So pumps are definitely the way to go. Um, it will make everybody's life much easier. In patients that don't tolerate that or that need a bit more, then ointments can be quite quite helpful. Just remember that there is no oil in an emulsifying ointment. It is just petrolatum mixed with um, white paraffin. So there's a 50-50 mix. And so you need to add the water. So oftentimes what I recommend is that patients take a flannel, they moisten that flannel, they rub it onto the skin that they're gonna be applying the ointment on and then the ointment goes on top. So you've applied the water, the ointment's going to seal it. If you take dry skin and you cover it with an ointment, you now have covered dry skin with ointment, but you have not hydrated. The only way to hydrate is to add water. And that again is the benefit of a cream because the water is mixed in with the ointment and it's a one-step process. By the time you make a lotion, you are mostly water with a little bit of, um, of ointment. Now, we had very high hopes for moisturizers. We hold them to a very high standard. And ideally, we would want moisturizers to be a steroid sparing agent, which means the patient comes in with active eczema, you give them a topical steroid, you say, please use this once or twice a day, five to seven days, it will improve your eczema. And then you could just use your moisturizer on a daily basis, and you should be fine. Well, that's, I've been doing this for a long time, and I can find, I can tell you rarely does that really happen? And so we have been desperate for products that bridge that gap between flares and more importantly, that lengthen the gap between flares. And I can say that now with the advent of the calcineurin inhibitors, they can do that to a certain extent. And so the way that you can get the most out of those products is that you treat with a topical steroid initially, you calm the eczema down, and then you use the calcineurin inhibitor as a maintenance drug. And so I will have patients use it to the, their problem areas, even when the skin is looking normal, two to three times a week. That is how the studies were done and shown that you lengthen the flare interval. So rather than cycling through steroids on a weekly basis or on a fortnightly basis, then maybe you can lengthen that to every four to six weeks they ha may have a bit of a flare. Um, and with the quote unquote smart moisturizers, they can to some extent do this for you as well, better than our traditional moisturizers have been able to do so. So what makes these moisturizers different? And what you see here on the right are moisturizers that are not subsidized, but are available over the counter in New Zealand that will have to varying degrees, certain concentrations of ceramides, cholesterol, fatty acids, and other vitamins and ingredients that are deemed beneficial to repairing the skin barrier. Okay. And we'll spend the rest of our talk looking at the ingredients that are in CeraVe that make it different. So the first ingredient would be niacinamide, which is vitamin B3. Uh, and it turns out that niacinamide works adjunctively to help increase the amount of fatty acids and ceramides in the skin and to decrease the amount of transepidermal water loss. And we've been able to show that in very specific studies looking at this specifically over a four week period. And then the, cere the CeraVe gets its name from ceramides and then this multivesicular emulsion which we call an MVE. And that VE is a vesicle that is almost a layered approach of these ingredients. So ceramides, phytosphingosine, hyaluronic acid, glycerin, dimethicone oil, and water. And these layers are delivered 
over time so that the product continues to moisturize over a time period, as opposed to giving you a quick burst release as you get from the non-physiologic or the traditional moisturizers. So essentially in this MVP, M MVE, you have these layers of oil and water that are slowly released over time, as you can see in the diagram. And then again, another diagram showing that same thing where traditionally you, the patients will say, well, I use the, the moisturizer and my skin will feel moisturized for about 20 minutes and then it just feels dry again. So this is trying to counteract that by, by delivering these very slowly over time. And so the other thing is that these ingredients, these ceramides, these lipids, they're actually active within the, um, the epidermis. And so we're gonna to refer to the ingredients in CeraVe as physiologic lipids. And this is in contrast to a non-ceramide product or a traditional moisturizer that have a non-physiologic lipid. And the bottom line is, is that when you use something like petrolatum or white paraffin on the skin, as you can see in the top right here, it's just going to sit on the stratum corneum. It's going to be occlusive and it's going to physically block the, trans, the transmission mostly of water and potentially of irritants through the skin, but that's it. With these products that are more physiologically active, they're actually going to penetrate through the stratum corneum and they're going to penetrate into the keratinocytes that are in within that stratum granulosum. Um, and what we see here is a, a series of cartoons that are showing you just that. So we start out with a, with a normal epidermis and then as the, the um, CeraVe is applied, these physiological physiologic lipids are penetrating through the stratum corneum into the stratum granulosum, into these keratinocytes that are still quite active and have all of their organelles and nucleus intact. Um, and these lipids are going to be absorbed. They're gonna go into the Golgi apparatus and they're going to create, create these lamellar bodies, which are then going to make their way into the interface between the stratum granulosum and the stratum corneum and deliver these lamellar bodies into that brick and mortar or that corneocyte and lipid bilayer, which is where they need to be. Um, and here you can see how as they're extruded, they're gonna help to rebuild that lipid bilayer that is, that is deficient. So that's a great theory. That was a very beautiful little diagram. The question is, does it really do that? And the answer is yes. So when, when um, it was studied back in 2008, uh, when it first made its appearance into the US, there were studies that looked, at, such as this one, that looked at a steroid by itself and the effect that it had on eczema. And then they had a mild steroid with a CeraVe cleanser. And then the third group had the mild steroid, the CeraVe cleanser, and the CeraVe moisturizer. And what you found was almost a twofold improvement in eczema clearance when you added the CeraVe moisturizer. So it clearly was having an impact beyond that which the steroid could provide. Um, and when you looked at the global disease severity score, you saw the same. So that score dropped significantly in the patients that were using the mild steroid with the CeraVe cream. And when you look at just dry skin, so not, not just eczema, but looking at dry skin, can we improve dry skin with these products? And again, the answer was yes. Um, we could see a reduction in skin irritation almost immediately. So a decrease in the itching, the burning and the stinging. Uh, and more importantly, that improvement, you have an increase in ceramide content that lasted even 48 hours after you last applied it. So those results weren't dependent on just continually using the drug, but clearly it was being absorbed because you were still seeing improvement two days after it was last applied. And the same is true, more modest um, improvement, but increase in cholesterol levels and free fatty acid levels. So those are ceramides, that's CeraVe, but that by itself doesn't treat eczema. So let's look at other factors that play a role. And this is where the microbiome is becoming increasingly important. Not, we know lots about the gut microbiome, but this is specifically the skin microbiome. And in this case, we've got a microbiome 
map based on the location on the body, based on whether the skin is oily or it's moist or whether it's dry. And we can see that there are going to be different bacteria that are going to be represented in these cases. And it isn't just bacteria, but it's bacteria, there's viruses, there's parasites, um, and, and much to the operation of most patients, mites that live on our skin, especially in those hair follicles that can lead to conditions um, such as rosacea and, and adult acne. So the manipulation of this microbiome microbiome is going to be very important. Uh, and I know that there are already products that are being tested in the US um, to, to alter this microbiome using bacteria rather than using antibiotics. And so I hope that in the near future, we really have a paradigm shift in how we manage staph colonization and eczema and, and no longer have to resort to using antibiotics, but can then you know just sort of manipulate the skin microbiome so that we can titrate or have an increase in the healthier bacteria so that we can improve um, the skin condition without obliterating all of, all of the bacteria at once. So it, this is a nice diagram that shows how the skin alterations of the skin microbiome can contribute to eczema. So if we look at um, skin barrier dysfunction, which we know is a hallmark of eczema, so you're already starting with abnormal filaggrin production, the skin is already dry. Now you've got loss of um, transepidermal water loss that then damages the keratinocytes. It damages the pH, it raises the pH of the skin. It creates trauma within those keratinocytes, which in turn are going to release inflammatory cytokines. And you're gonna have a breakdown of the skin. As the staph begins to build, the staph aureus will create a biofilm depicted here by this goopy green line, and it will start producing staph aureus toxin. And I, I think you can all, if you close your eyes, you can all picture that patient that you have that comes in every month with focal eczema patches studded with little erosions. And the only way they get better is if you give them oral antibiotics. And they come off the antibiotics and then you get the phone call. Oh, can you please give me some more because my eczema is back. We all have these patients. So when you see them, now you can picture this, this in your mind and it can help you understand what is happening. And anecdotally, I can tell you that when that patient comes in, you can give them all the steroids you want. You can give them all the moisturizers you want. If we don't address the staff, we don't address the biofilm, they're not going to get better. You can escalate the steroids and you're not gonna see the same level of clearance if you don't address the staff. And sometimes they can get quite sick and they can develop cellulitis and end up having to be hospitalized. But basically with the toxin production, with the activation of the longer run cells, you get this IL-4, IL-5, IL-13. So a TH2 induced differentiation response in the immune system. And in some cases, patients can develop IgE to staph toxin and to staph aureus. So this is the same type of allergy that they would have to peanuts, that they would have to shellfish, that they would have to dairy. So you can have an IgE response to staph. At the moment, I don't have a way to test to say which patient is going to do that, but I can say that you know when these patients come in requiring antibiotics all the time, it's real, it's physiologic, it's the staph. So we have to do everything we can to try to control that staph. And obviously the answer isn't just oral antibiotics. We've, we've got to be a little bit smarter than that. Um, and so this is where bleach bath comes in. And, and, and if you're having discussions with families and they're giving you resistance as to why you want them to have a bleach bath, this can be your way in. And contrary to our original belief, the sodium hypochlorite or the dilute bleach, it, it's not bactericidal. It does not kill Staph aureus, but it will affect the biofilm, and it helps you break that biofilm down. So what I explain to patients is, look, when the skin is open, when your eczema is raw and, and it's eroded, you're going to have bacteria colonizing it. And if the bacteria links together and creates that biofilm, we're losing the battle, and we're not gonna be able to get the same effect from the topical management. And so what the bleach baths do is they break down that biofilm and they make it easier for the body to deal with the staph. Um, and so I would recommend that if you have, um, if you can have quick access to the bleach bath re recipe that you do so in, in your clinic, otherwise you can really easily just Google Starship guidelines for bleach bathing and, and this recipe will come up. Depending on the brand of bleach that they're using, it will have different concentrations of bleach and then that will impact you know, how, how they make their recipe. And oftentimes we'll give them a 10 cc syringe and let them use that you know, when, 
when they're trying to make their dilutions. Now, in addition to that, there is there, there are um, newer products on the market that um, are addressing these biofilms in, in more elegant ways. And so this is another product by La Roche uh, Posay called Lipocarbon, and it contains mycorrhizal, which is a type of sugar that is um, derived from a tuberous fruit. And what you're seeing here are electron microscopy images of untreated control where it's it's filled with staph and with staph biofilms. And then the result, when you apply that mycorrhizal, you can see disruption of the biofilm. Um, and so this ingredient is in the Lipicarbom AP plus M product that can be found in um, online and, and specialty pharmacies. And this is used as a moisturizer. Now, um, what I find is that if you use it on open raw skin, it, it can sting. So the way I use this product is that I would treat the eczema first, I would calm the inflammation down either with, you know, something like a sorbeline or a CeraVe and a, and a mild topical steroid. And once the skin is improved and looking as normal as possible, then you can introduce this product and use it as a maintenance to see if you can lengthen that flare interval. Now, we've done everything right. Right, where you we have a patient with a patch of eczema, where we have them on the proper moisturizer, we have them on a on a proper topical antibiotic. I mean, a topical corticosteroid. Um, we're doing our bleach baths if it's indicated for them, and then the patient comes in like this toddler, and mom will say, "It doesn't matter what I put on their skin, everything stings, everything hurts. It's a battle. She's crying, I'm crying, running around the house." No one's getting any sleep and everyone is miserable. And I bring this up because this is more common than you realize. Um, and I allude this to just an extreme in the barrier dysfunction. And so you can get this aversion to products. And that's where we have to kind of take a step back and say, well, is it just a barrier dysfunction or are we now dealing with a wound? And do we need to repair that wound? And what are some ways or, or products that we can use to do that. Um, and so at a very basic level, these are patients that I will treat with ointments as opposed to creams. Um, definitely not with lotions, because again, the more water and the more preservatives, the more emulsifiers, the more likely that they are to sting. And then I want to introduce you to a whole line of um, products that are over the counter that are considered wound healing um, in their approach or barrier products. And so they're the reason that they are different than moisturizers is that they're going to help with proliferation of keratinocytes, because if you have a wound, you need to regrow skin. They're going to help with the microorganisms that are there, because you need a relatively sterile or bactericidal environment in order to grow healthy skin. You need to prevent ongoing trauma or itch, so they're going to be anti-inflammatory. And lastly, they're going to hydrate. So a hydrated wound is going to heal faster than a dry wound. Um, and this is just a depiction of how that happens. So when you have a wound, you then have the body comes in, cleanses the area. You have growth of keratinocytes actually from the periphery and they, they come in from the sides. And then as those keratinocytes are growing, you've got thickening or re-epithelialization of, of the epidermis and then finally repair with, with improvement deeper um, and increased collagen. And so these are all products that you can find in New Zealand over the counter. And these are barrier products that are gonna contain some degree of ingredients that are going to address this. Most of them were actually developed as dribble rash creams because that is the classic irritant dermatitis or a wound um, that any of you who treat a lot of irritant dermatitis or dribble rash know can be miserable for families until you can get it right. So. As a result, we're going to focus just on the, the, um, the Roche-Posay product, Cicaplast, and talk to you about the active ingredients. So panthenol, macadesicide, shea butter, zinc, and glycerin, and why those are in there. So panthenol, um, one of the B vitamins, is going to help inhibit inflammation. And so clearly you need to do that in order to repair the skin. So reduce the redness, reduce the pain, reduce the itch, reduce the discomfort. Macadesicide is going to help regrow those keratinocytes help with collagen production. And this is showing where they did a study using this on a wound and that they could get it to heal two days faster when this was applied. 
Um, and while these were originally developed for dribble rash, they now have expanded their indication. And honestly, you can use it for any kind of broken skin, whether it's a lip dermatitis or pro post chemotherapy, radiation dermatitis, um, very, very dry skin. Patients that are on isotretinoin, for example, and have really dry skin, they could benefit from this. Post-insect bites, pretty much any time that there's a breakdown, this, this can help. And I save it for those patients with eczema that are just resistant to any type of moisturizer. I will try this first, repair that barrier so that then I can introduce um, a, a more traditional moisturizer. So again, this is these are the products and they can be found, you know, local chemist, or online pharmacies. So we've talked a lot today about um, eczema and its potential triggers. The main thing is not to ignore the skin barrier. The anatomy of the skin barrier is extremely important. When that physiology is altered, when the anatomy is altered, it's going to impact eczema. And if you ignore it, you will struggle in improving your, your patients. Uh, it will take longer. Um, just know that you know skin barrier alone isn't going to be enough. We still need to be using topical steroids, topical casinurin inhibitors um, when there's inflammation, when there's significant erythema, um, and staph. That's a big player, uh, and we can't ignore that either. So cleansing the skin, bleach bathing, treating infection when it has gone to the point of, of needing oral treatment is is extremely important. And the take home message. It takes a village. It takes all of these in concert without ignoring your individual patient and what ticks for them, what triggers their eczema. If you can, the more that you can personalize it, the better your results will be. So thank you. And we'll now take your questions. Wonderful. Thanks, Lisa. There's a lot of um, good information in there and, and um, I think a change compared to what we traditionally do with eczema. So it's wonderful to get a bit of a background as to why we should be changing what we do. Um, there have been a few questions coming through. First of all, there's a question about what percentage of childhood eczema would be affected by food allergens and is there any role for skin testing to exclude or to diagnose this? Yeah, I would say the minority. So most patients with eczema do not have food allergy as their primary trigger. Yeah. Okay. Um, now, do some patients have food allergy triggering or aggravating their atopic eczema? Yes. Now, how do you decide? And believe it or not, I think the best way is that you put them on aggressive, appropriate treatment, and you do that for at least two weeks, okay? I find that there's a lot of under-treatment of eczema. You treat a chronic condition and you wanna treat it in three days. That's impossible, we can't. <laughs> you, if, if you had, if, if, you know, if, if you decided to you know, burn, burn all your bush and then you're gonna have a little hose and you're gonna break, you know, calm that, squash that, that's not gonna happen. So just remember, aggressive treatment, for a certain period of time and then see what happens. So normally what happens is I have a patient come in, say a three month old, they have eczema tip to toe, full body, so, so itchy that they are just clawing at themselves in front of you. Um, mom is breastfeeding and they're there and they're asking for help. So my first line, regardless of what I'm suspecting, my first line is an appropriate moisturizer an appropriate topical steroid. In this case, I would probably opt for something like locoid lipo cream because mm -hmm. it's a good um, sort of mild to moderate drug. And I would have them use it twice a day, everywhere neck down. And I would do it for seven to 10 days or until the eczema is clear. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then I would do a quick follow up. So I would say, okay, I will see you in two weeks. And once they've stopped the loquid, I would say, well, I want you to keep using the moisturizer and I want to see what happens and change nothing else. Don't change the diet. Don't, don't change anything else. You keep them on their diet. You're just going to aggressively treat the eczema. And what I find is the patients that are going to have a food allergy, the history is usually that, wow, after three days of aggressive use of, say, the loquid, they looked fabulous. And the skin is clear for the first time in forever. Um, and then when they stopped using the locoid within two days, the itch started, the redness started, and they are tip to toe. So at two weeks, they now look only slightly better than they did when you first saw them. That's the patient that you need to suspect something else is going on. And it isn't just food allergy. It could be an immune deficiency. 
uh, sometimes we have to biopsy these patients to know what's going on. But I can tell you that I've had patients like this where we do a biopsy. The biopsy shows heaps of eosinophils. I've had the pathologist tell me this looks exactly like the pathology of a child with eosinophilic esophagitis. Um, we put these patients on a, um, you know, elemental formula, a, you know, neocate or something similar, and we find that the eczema then is under control. Is it gone? No. Are they manageable? Yes. So use your treatment as a proof of principle, and it's the ones that fail appropriate treatment that then are worth further investigation, or in this case, a referral. I mean, that's, that's what we're here for. Um, the ones that treat, but then they stop because they look better and then they go back to it, that's different. So really hold them to it and make sure that they are using the treatment appropriately and they're not just using it for two or three days and then stopping and then going back for two or three days and then stopping because that's not the same. And, 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 and that can make a big difference too. Uh, and Ange, that segues quite nicely into the uh, question that has come up around um, Traditionally, some of us have been taught to use stronger topical steroids to start, get on top of the information um, really quickly and let everything settle down and then step down in terms of your steroids. Um, while you're sort of suggesting stay maybe at that lower mid-range and then step up instead. Can you comment on the well, traditional I, you know, I, I think it's I think it's because um, there's the steroid phobia that you have to use the steroid for five days and stop. And if you used a mild to moderate steroid for five days and stopped, you wouldn't get there. You're, you're not going to control the inflammation sufficiently enough to then have a disease free period. And so then if you went with a more potent steroid, you could probably get a similar response in a shorter period of time. But what I find is that then the patients want that stronger steroid all the time. They don't want to put in the work. So yes. they want the dermal. They want the beta cream for the face. They, they, they want that stronger one because, hey, I used it over three days and then it goes away. But I have to explain that that dermal in a two-year-old is going to lead to systemic immune suppression. And that's not our goal. Our goal is local immune suppression, not systemic. And so I think that that's where you can get into um, heaps of trouble. Yeah, you're right. The response um, feeds into the idea that they want to use a strong one all the time. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but if you're so, going to have them use a milder one, you have to reassure them that they can use it for longer. And that's where I think there's a gap in, in the knowledge. And what's the longest you would use it for, the mild one? So just to give you an idea, so I was, I was involved in a lot of the clinical trials that were done for local lipocream. And I can tell you that of all the steroids that are available in New Zealand, local lipocream is the most extensively studied drug in atopic eczema in the U.S., hands down. Um, and when I was doing my training in pediatric derm, we were studying it and we were treating patients three months and up. And they were, the study was looking at HPA access suppression. So they came in day one, we did blood tests just for screening. And then we gave them the locoid and we said, please use this twice a day. They had to be moderate to severe, use it twice a day until the eczema is gone. And that could take one week, two weeks, three weeks or up to four weeks hmm. we're giving them for the study. We found that most of them didn't need it for four weeks. Most of them would clear within the first one to two weeks. Mm -hmm. The ones that didn't, that's where I'm saying you have to look for other factors. That's not normal. These are your outliers that then, then need to be worked out. But normally within one to two weeks, those patients cleared. Um, and as we were checking HP, HP access suppression, we were finding that at two weeks, there wasn't any. So if, mm -hmm. even though locoid is very locally, focally skin immune suppressant, it does not get into the bloodstream. So of all the drugs, it's the one that I'm least fearful of. Um, yeah. That and maybe 1% hydrocortisone <laughs> because there's been so much testing. Um, and then at four weeks again. So that's what then led to the FDA indication that you could use locoid three months and up. Okay. And so you've mentioned now two, two that you don't mind using in terms of the steroids. And there's a question that's come through of, of what are your um, steroids of choice in terms of the low, mid and high topical steroids that you would use. So you've mentioned those two. Is there a particular one that you would go to as your next step up? Yeah, so you've got a few. So you have Aristocort, um, you have Mometazone. Honestly, that's about it for me. I don't have to go up much higher than, than Mometazone. Okay. Unless I'm treating adults, and then that's different. And then yes, you know, you, then then there's room for um, you know, diprazone or rarely clobetazole. 
Um, but yeah, otherwise in children, that momentazone is about as, as high as I go. Yeah. Um, there's a question here around um, topical tacrolima. So the, the formulary has it as specialist initiated only. Should we as GPs be looking to initiate this more often as maintenance therapy for our patients to prevent their flares in between those steroid things? I, I wish you could. The benefit though is that once they have the special authority, it's a lifetime one. So then uh, you okay. can keep prescribing it. Yeah. Yeah. So no, I, I think it's wonderful. The problem is it's a very small tube. And if, and if it's going to be funded, they'll only give them a 30 gram tube every three months. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's not really as widely available as we would need it to be, um, to be efficacious, but at least it's a start, especially um, face and groin. So it's the initiation of the specialist authority that we need to get, but once it's there, we can carry on. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and there's quite a lot of questions around bleach bars, um, just in terms of, can we use them on open or raw skin? Can we use them on infected eczema? Can we use them um, with eczema around the ear um, or other cavities? Are we able to sort of use it at, at any point? Is uh, ble bleach bars good? Yes, yes, the answer is yes. Yeah. Unless it's a child that has an adverse reaction to the bleach bar. Okay. Oh, and there, there is a question around, are uh, the QV oils comparable to the bleach? Bars. Uh, you know, I'm not familiar with the QV oil specifically. It, it, does it claim to have? I guess if it claimed to have um, anti-staph coverage, um, yeah, yeah, it's hard to say. I don't really know the product specifically. Okay. okay. Um, there's a question here around sal salicylates. Do they impact eczema? Salicylates. Yeah. Uh, mm, I mean, it's not something that I'm routinely looking for. Mm -hmm. No, um, and I certainly wouldn't use salicylic acid on um, any of my eczema patients. No, okay. And I think you did have on when someone's asked any role of antihistamine to stop the itch. And I think you did have that in, on your slide as, a, as an option. We have it as an option. It, it doesn't work really well. Um, mm -hmm. If you have a traditional eczema patient, it's not gonna work. However, if you have that eczema patient, that also suffers from hay fever, who in the springtime will start to sneeze and have a runny nose and have a, have a sore throat, and then they develop an eyelid dermatitis. That's the patient you want in antihistamines because it is that environmental trigger that eventually is causing the eyelid dermatitis. And so I will often screen for that. Um, and if there's any history of hay fever, see if there's any seasonality to it, um, and then recommend the antihistamines seasonally. And you don't wait until you've had your flare and your eyelids are raw. You need to have them on board preventively. So as I explained to them, the antihistamine works to prevent the histamine release. But once that histamine has been released, it's not going to go in and gobble it up. So you want them on board pre-season and then through the season. And usually once they settle, whether if, you know, if it's a spring flare, usually by summer you can take them off. And again, in the fall would be the other peak. Yeah, and actually, there there are a couple of questions here around treating um, periodontal eczema, and what your what is your preference to use, and how would you use it? Yeah, so um, one issue I have in New Zealand is that hydrocortisone one percent, which I do use quite a bit on the face, um, only comes as a cream or as a, a lotion, uh, and the eyelid skin is so sensitive that these patients will often react even to the lotions and the creams. Um, so I'll give you my trick. Um, I will write for hydrocortisone 1% in white soft paraffin. And your chemist can compound it for your patients. And it's either free or just a very low charge. But that way you get an emollient um, base and you can use it on the eyelids and it works really, really well. Would you use it elsewhere as well, or just the eyelids? Groin, neck, um, honestly, infants. So infants that have yeah. um, sort of a, a, a mild thickening of their eczema, but it's quite right, widespread. I will often use the hydrocortisone 1% white soft paraffin, either all over, or I might start with the lopoid and then taper them down to the hydrocortisone 1% in white soft paraffin. And I find that that works quite well. Okay. Um, and I, there's a question here about what to use in children less than five months or, you know, less than six months of age. So is that the kind of thing you might use for them? Yeah. 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 But, you know, because of my experience, I'm comfortable with locoid over three months of age. Under that, then you use the 1% hydrocortisone. Okay. 
Um, there, I, there's a question here. Do you moisturize first, then use your steroid? That's, I think, the way we've no, been steroid, doing it. Steroid first. It depends what part of the body you're treating. If it's an active eczema lesion, steroid first. Don't dilute it. You need it in there. You need, you need to clear it as quick as possible. Mm -hmm. And then the moisturizer can go around. I don't want to make it too complicated for parents, but at, you know, the moisturizer goes around. And then at a different time, then you would use it over the eczema spot. If it's an infant, then I would say with every nappy change, you're putting something on the skin. So try, you know, alternate the steroid with the, with the um, moisturizer, et cetera. Okay. Um, how much do you think stress can affect eczema flares? And also, do you find children flare with teething and viral illnesses and, and all this, all sorts of stuff? Yeah, yeah. And um, stress can trigger itch. And I think you can see yeah. that in your patients. When they come in and they're uncomfortable, even you just walking in the room, they'll, they'll start, they'll start scratching and they, they start to get edgy. Or the parents will say, if I reprimand my child or if I put them on the naughty chair, all of a sudden they'll start scratching themselves to bits. So, you know, stress doesn't make anything better. And even a toddler under the right circumstances can feel stressed. So yes, absolutely. And any, any infection, any inflammation will, will flare eczema, whether it's a viral exanthem, whether it's COVID, whatever, it can certainly do that. Um, there's a couple of questions around, or a few more around steroid use. Um, one is around methylprednisolone being used because um, it's less systemically absorbed. And is that an, an option that you could use initially? That you can um, use it on the face, yep. Yeah. Yeah. And what um, do you think of routine steroid use every weekend to control flares? Well, see, in my mind, if they're flaring every weekend, they're not controlled. Mm. Right. So if you if if you're treating the flare, you're treating the flare and you're treating it aggressively and you're treating it until it resolves. Um, and then you have to see when when do they reflare? And that's where I would say maybe a calcineurin inhibitor. Mm -hmm. on the weekends uh, i'm sorry during the week in order to lengthen that interval um and then if you find that patients will have a stubborn spot often they'll say look it's, it's on my leg no matter what i do unless i'm using a steroid then what we might say is okay well let's use the customer inhibitors during the week and then you can do a burst of the steroid on the weekend so mm -hmm. yeah i mean it, it's not ideal but sometimes you, you just don't have a choice. Although for those patients, I'm always after like, what is the trigger? Why is that spot so recalcitrant? You know, are they wearing gum boots? What are their activities? Like you, you just don't, don't give up until you can find a trigger. Mm -hmm. um, how would you treat the thickening, the skin thickening, lichenification of the skin separately, you know, after you've, you've sort of calmed everything down? Can you manage that? Can it, will it go away? Yeah. Yeah, wet wraps can work really, really well. So if you have a focal area that's like kinified, then you can use your steroid and um, say it's on the leg, you can take a sock and just moisten the sock and then put that on and then put a dry sock over the top. Um, or if, if, if you're able to get, you know, some of the bandages from, from your local district nurses, um, then you sort of bandage the skin. But that's one area where wet wraps can be really, really helpful. Mm. Um, there's a few questions around the over-the-counter moisturizers um, as, as to how do we, can we write them out? How do we prescribe them? Can they be compounded or do we buy them? Do we just write them, give, you know, write down the brand name or how would you do, how do you manage that? Well, so one thing I like to do is I actually will try to have samples of the products that I'm going to use. And, and I even go as far as having sorbylene Cetomacrogol, non-ionic, emulsifying ointment. I have that in my office. And I would, I would urge you all to do that. One, because it's going to familiarize you with the product. And two, because you can introduce it to your patients when they're in the room with you. So that if they immediately react, you don't waste their time, you don't waste your own time. And I can tell you, if they're going to react, it's within minutes. So much so that I will distract the child, I will put it on one arm, and then on the other arm, I might put something else. In the meantime, we're just chit-chatting away, and I'm just observing. And if you find that, that they, they're going like this, because they don't want to disappoint you, they, they, they try to be stoic, and they try not to scratch, but they can't help themselves. So if you're seeing any kind of reaction, regardless of their age, I can tell you from all my years of experience, it's real. And the opposite is also true. When you put something on that feels really nice on their skin, they love it. And the way you know is because they're going to ask you for more. So you can at least be reassured and the family can be reassured that by the time they've left your office, you've given them one product that is going to work. 
Um, the same with these products. You know, they're, they're going to have to pay for it. They're they're mm -hmm. They're affordable, but they still have to pay for it. So ask for samples. The the um, the reps can supply you with them. Try it in the office and see which one they like best. Um, or I will say, look, these are your options. Um, if I have samples, I give them samples of what I have and I let them try it for a few days. Otherwise, I will say, look, just go to your chemist and buy the smallest size of a few and then let them try it at home. Because at the end of the day, it's it's personalized. Do they like the smell? Do they like the feel? Is it cold? Is it not too cold? All these sensory issues can also play a role. Uh, there, are, uh, do you have any recommendations for the very dry lips, the, the lip smacker um, irritation? Yeah, so that's where those barrier creams can be quite helpful. Um, so that would be one thing. The secondly is avoiding the um, over-the-counter lip balms because they're yes. full of fragrance. And especially that menthol. So initially it feels really good, but they can develop a contact allergy to the fragrance. And so they use it, they're better for a minute. And then that triggers more dryness, more cracking. So they use more of it and they're perpetuating the cycle. So moving away from that, that's where petrolatum, plain petrolatum can be quite helpful. The barrier creams, if, if they're very, very red and inflamed, sometimes you do have to use a topical steroid, calm that down and, and then keep using your barriers. And how long would you use a topical steroid in that place in your lips? Is it the same thing? About five to seven days, usually, maybe less. You really just tell them, you know, you treat till the those symptoms are gone. Yeah. Okay. Um, is there a situation where you would use urea? Urea creams. Yeah, yeah. Yes and no. So urea is really good at hydrating, mm -hmm. but it isn't always as well tolerated. So yes, you can use it. I tend to use it more in my adult patients um, that come in with those extremely dry legs. Um, I find it very, very helpful, um, especially when they have really dry toenails and they can't figure out how to, how to trim them. Um, but I don't use it as much in children. Uh, and sorry, someone's gone back to the lips. What specific barrier creams would you suggest for the lips? So, you, um, um, you yeah, so the, one, the ones that were in the talk, so the Sikapas, yep. the... the um, the um i think there's a bio oil um event makes one too yeah they do sometimes sting though there don't they and i well, think you get that then you, then you have to go more basic then you'd have yeah. to go to the um, emulsifying ointment yeah the, um the e45 is another brand um that's quite bland yeah yeah okay um should we be trialing the calcium urine inhibitors in all patients along the side steroids or are we just trialing along those ones that don't seem to respond or clear with steroids? Is it, is it the way of the future? Uh, um, okay, look, so the calcium urine inhibitors have been available in the US for 20 years. Um, yeah. Have they replaced the way that we manage eczema? No, they haven't. So clearly there's a role for them, but they're, they're not the panacea and they're not the cure-all. Otherwise we wouldn't be talking about all these other drugs down the pipeline. Mm -hmm. um, I think that there's an art to using them. Um, the pimacrolimus isn't very strong. And it only comes as a cream. So really, it's at the potency of about a 1% hydrocortisone, maybe a little bit stronger. So where I've had huge success with pimacrolimus is using it in patients with psoriasis of the groin. So that's specific. And some patients with facial eczema. And that's about as far as I can take it. Okay. With the, um, the tacrolimus, it is more potent. It comes as an ointment. Mm -hmm. However, if you use it on active eczema, it, it can cause this immediate warmth and mm -hmm. almost stinging sensation. So you have to convince the patient to treat through that. And not everyone's on board with that. So the way to get around it is that you treat them with a topical steroid first. You calm the inflammation down. Then you introduce the tacrolimus. And hopefully if they get a little bit of that warmth, they're, they're, still, they're still willing to give it a go, then they'll see the benefits of it. Now, being completely pragmatic, the tubes are 30 grams, they're this big. So at the moment, unless money is not an option and they can pay for it out of pocket, which is anywhere between 80 to $100 for a 30 gram tube, you're just not gonna be able to dispense enough to make a difference in a patient with significant eczema. Mm -hmm. But if you can use it on the face and you can use it as a steroid sparing agent and, and you can use it the way that I just described, which is as maintenance, then at least it'll spare them from needing steroid as often. So we're close, but we're not there. 
Yeah. There's a question about um, topical tacrolimus. If you, can you take that together with oral acyclovir and is it safe? I'm assuming that would be okay. Fine. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and what are your thoughts on Isledale? That's the pimicrolimus people. that I was talking about. So that's ah, yes. yeah. and that's where I, I, it's it's weak. And if if, yeah. if you can get it to work, that's wonderful. Um, in yeah. my hands, like I said, groin psoriasis and very mild yeah. eczema. Or yeah. sometimes patients will come in with um, pityriasis alba, and that's where you have a hypopigmented um, sort of pre-eczema state. It can help with that. Yeah. Mm. Uh, do you know much about the use of kawakawa balm for calming itching dermatitis? So kawa -kawa I would balm. love to study kawakawa balm. <laughs> I, it, it definitely is anti-inflammatory. I, I don't know yeah. how. Mm -hmm. um, so in patients that come in saying that they're using kawakawa balm, um, I have two questions for them. One, do you like it? Is it helpful? And if the answer is yes, then I say, well, what, what is your recipe? Because everyone has their own recipe depending on um, which auntie or Nana is making it for them. And the, the key thing here is to not include any fragrances mm. in the kawakawa because um, they'll want to add lavender, they'll want to add calendula, they'll want to add all these natural herbs that to the body are natural fragrances. The body doesn't differentiate. So I will usually say, look, kawakawa in coconut oil, kawakawa in olive oil. If they like it, if they swear by it, if they think it's wonderful, then I don't have a problem with it. Um, I have, I, I do think it, is effective i just don't know how yeah well, to be looked at in the future um mm -hmm. with alongside the bleach baths we're often talked about pine tassel using pine tassel in the shower and bath do you find that it is very effective do you use it with your patients so same thing i will say two questions one do you love it is it helping you and if the answer is yes okay fine keep using it if the answer is no then i move on to something else because yeah. the pine is there and you can become allergic to the pine uh -huh. so i'm very very um yeah, I very weary of yeah. using it. Yeah. What's your recommendation on treating vesicular hand dermatitis? And lots of hand dermatitis at the moment. So uh, yeah. Mm. Uh, so hand dermatitis is a beast all on its own. Um, and so you know, if you're talking about the clear vesicles, the pomphylix or dyshydrosis yeah. uh, type picture, um, that's extremely, extremely itchy. Um, oftentimes you do need to use a more potent topical steroid. So that's not what I'm referring to when I say use a mid potency steroid mild. This is different. So that now you're dealing yeah. with, with hand, hand dermatitis. Um, if you're lucky enough to find a culprit, that's wonderful. Oftentimes these are patients that we're having to treat systemically either with methotrexate or in some cases of hand dermatitis, you would treat with an oral retinoid okay. uh, and sort of have an overlap with psoriasis. Okay. Uh, and actually, there's a question around um, using oral prednisolone, um, and do you use it, and how do you titrate it for those patients who need it? Yeah. Um, so I, I I don't use it as often. I have to say, um, I think American training is a little bit more conservative, and so we will exploit topical use longer before we would go to oral. Um, but being in New Zealand and, and certainly seeing these refractory patients where you don't have another choice, um, I will start it at about a milligram per kilo. Usually I'm dealing with children and so that it's quite accurate. Um, it, it's different with adults. Um, I think in, in the case of adults, you really want to use more ideal body weight rather than a milligram per kilo. Mm -hmm. um, and rarely do I go above 40 to 50 milligrams a day in an adult um, unless they happen to be a very big person. Um, and then um, if it's an adult, say that I've started them at 40 milligrams, um, I will drop it by about 10 milligrams every week. So we would go 40, 30, 20, and then I'd go to 15, 10. So a long taper, it has to be at least three weeks long, at yeah. least three weeks, anything shorter than that. And they're, and they're going to rebound. Um, and usually it's because they're secondarily infected. So you're giving them oral antibiotics as well. Um, in children at a milligram per kilo and then just dropping accordingly. And again, extending it over three to five weeks. Okay, can you give a regime for treating adhesive reactions? Um, what should we see to plasters and various uh, things? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, you know, the solution is stop using the plaster. Yeah. <laughs> But that's not always the case with our stoma patients or, you know, the patches are quite popular. So even our diabetes yeah. patients that are having to use that. Um, and pumps and things like that. Yeah. yeah, the pumps. Right, right. It's so hard. Mm -hmm. It's so hard. Um, I, I find that the companies can be quite resourceful there and they usually will have nurses 
um, that, that can guide you. Um, sometimes there's nothing else that you can do but to give them a mid to potent topical steroid. And, and so as soon as they move the patch around, if they can keep it on for no longer than three to five days, that's ideal because anything longer than it really becomes extreme. So if they can keep the patch on for short periods of time and then as they move it, then you just treat that area with a steroid and you chase it. Yeah. I don't really have any yeah. mind answers. No, that's good. And um, there's a slightly off topic question, but I think a very useful one um, for all of us. Can you recommend a, a, a cheap high SPF sunscreen that we can prescribe or we can suggest for our patients that may not have a huge amount of um, um, money to be to be buying the more expensive ones oh that's one of my pet peeves honestly i think that i don't know why we still pay gst on sunscreen it's, it's <laughs> um whole nother talk I, I, yeah that's it's a it's a tough question my favorite my favorite used to be one by q um by uh it wasn't qb which wasn't it was sun sense was one of my favorite um but then recently you know how they they look at the different sunscreens and they didn't quite meet the mark. So I think it's it's ever evolving. And so I would go by those guidelines that are published every year as to which of the sunscreens are meeting the SPF um, guidelines. Um, I know La Roche makes, makes a, uh, several good sunscreens for the face. They make a wet one for the body that is really nice. Um, you could go with the more um, elemental ones. So like the invisible zincs that are gonna be more, um, physiologic uh, blockers. Um, skinnies is another one that we mentioned because a little goes a really long way with that one. Um, but look, at the end of the day with eczema patients, it's gonna be trial and error. So I will just recommend a whole range and they're gonna have to see what, what they tolerate. But I've yet to find a cheap, really effective sunscreen. Mm. I think that's and do they end up having to change, like, do, you know, do they change the, the sunscreen that they use very often? Or well, once you've found one, you can stick with it for a long time. There's no issues with them developing. Yeah, unless the company changes the formulation. Yeah. yeah they yeah. just stick with it and, and then go with it. Yeah, okay. Uh, I've got time for a couple more. How long would you um, treat to clear staph from the skin? What's your length? Oh, I think that's impossible. Yeah. Yeah, they're, once they're colonized, they're colonized. So you're, yeah. you're, you're treating so that you can get um, disease response. Mm. Um, and some patients just, just need to be on those bleach baths um, or, um, you know, this is slightly controversial, but I, I'm a believer in using a cleanser on the skin. So obviously I'm not using a super potent, you know, Dettol Palm Olive, but there, are, there, there is a whole range of gentle skin cleansers that are not going to strip the skin, but will help to sort of gently debride and cleanse. And more importantly, they're putting all this product on. You almost need to get some of that off and then start over. Mm -hmm. um, and so I am a big believer of that. I do not use moisturizers as cleansers. I do not. Um, I've yet to find an effective study to show that that is better than either plain water or using a gentle cleanser. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll bring this up because it is extremely confusing, but this whole issue of aqueous cream as a cleanser, um, I will, I, I, what I recommend is, is write aqueous, write prescription for a patient for aqueous cream and have them bring it in. And what you find is that there are two different types of aqueous creams in New Zealand. There is an aqueous cream that has SLS, which is a soap, a surfactant, and there is an aqueous cream that is SLS free. And what I find is that the pharmacists don't always distinguish between the two. And so I have written for it just to see what I get. And it's a lottery as to whether I get SLS or I get SLS free. Now, there was one study out of the UK where they used aqueous cream with SLS and they used it as a um, steroid supplement, as a replacement. And they found that when they used it to bathe the skin of, of, of eczema patients, that they, they responded really well and they they did great, right? But if you look at how the product is sort of labeled, branded, marketed, it's a cream. And so patients started using it as a cream. And what you find is that if you have soap in the cream and you use it as a cream and you leave it on your skin, guess what? It's irritating. 
So then they said, oh, that's no good. So then they made an, an aqueous cream without the SLS and they started using that instead. But now you took out the only part that could potentially clean the skin and you're leaving <laughs> oil and water with emulsifiers and preservatives and you're using that. So it's too confusing unless you're very, very specific about what they're using, if they can tolerate the SLS, um, you know, and, 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 and you're clear that that's how they're going to use it, that's fine. Um, but I just make it a point that if the families come in and they love it, that they learn to read the label and make sure that they're getting what they're expecting. Otherwise, it could potentially lead, I think, to, to more infection. Yeah. Look, that's wonderful, Lisa. I think we've, we've run out of time. Um, we've got through hopefully most of the questions that have come through. Um, but I think with this type of stuff, we could um, keep asking forever. So thank you so much. And lucky New Plymouth to have have you on board and I'm, I'm sure you might have a few people trying to contact you to to track you down 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 there so that's, yeah. thanks very much happy, for tonight happy to be here and happy to be contacted yeah. thank All you right. good night everyone thank you for coming